but he got any bananas? Well, hold on. Well, are you going to eat them the right way or the wrong way? What is, what's, what's the wrong way of eating the banana? Long ways. There uh, is no manly way to eat a banana, okay? Yeah, you break a piece off and then you... <laughs> Still, you're eating a banana, dude. So the year is 1950. <laughs> bananas just came into existence. They weren't, they weren't worried about how people were eating bananas. In the 1950s. So continuing our series of comics and their importance throughout the time, we're in the 1950s to 1959. Mm-hmm. We are. That was a crazy goddamn time. It was. Yeah. Paul, Paul, it was so crazy that Paul's silent just staring at my soul. That's right. Um, no, it's not a podcast unless he's staring into your eyes. Listen, to me, the 50s to me is probably one of the, one of my favorite decades in general, just because everything going on at the time. But comic books, I mean, they don't call it the golden age for no reason, Which right? Which is towards the end of the golden age. Yes. Right. So just to set the stage, 1950s, we have the Korean War was going on. Apparently, if you were a communist, you weren't very well liked. True. So, well, that's that's when you start getting to like the mid fifties. Yeah, this is where you start the congressional hearings where they were trying to oust uh, certain Hollywood uh, actors and personas as being red. Uh, more famous was Lucille Ball, Walt Disney, Ronald Reagan, Judy Garland. You also had um, the influence that we see sitcoms today. I Love Lucy premiered. You had the polio vaccine was created in nineteen fifty three. There you go. Uh, Queen Elizabeth. Did they make everybody get it though? Yeah, they did. Okay. Yeah. Uh, people were getting messed up with polio back then. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth II becomes Queen of England. You had Rosa Parks refuse to give up her seat on the bus. Brown versus the Board of Education. And the space race was in full effect. Yep. So NASA started in 1958 and the USSR launched Sputnik in 1957. Nice. Yeah. And during this time, we also have the Cold War going on. The Cold War as well, yes. And Jimmy got an A in history. (laughs) Yes, I did. (laughs) Wah, wah, wah. So going into the golden age of comics, there's a lot of stuff that happened here. A ton of stuff. So um, not a lot with Marvel, though. Not yet. Not yet. Marvel's still dormant at this time. Stay tuned to the 1960s show because that's going to be very Marvel heavy. Yes, it is. So with Marvel, they were still doing the Westerns, the romance. Uh, towards the end of the 1950s, they launched Tales of Suspense number one. Yep. Which later introduces us to Iron Man and Black Widow. Yep. Mm-hmm. You also had um, some of the cartoons that we know as kids, that we learned as kids, launched during this time. So we had Peanuts. We had Peanuts in 1950. You had Dennis the Menace in 1951. And then it spawned all those iterations you know, of, of similar titles, like Little, Little Jinx, Little Archie. Came out because of that. You had Pat the Brat. Pat the Brat. Yeah, you had a bunch of like, either they were inspired by Dennis the Menace or just complete ripoffs. I've never heard of Pat the Brat. Me never neither. Ever. Little Adventures of Little Pit Squeak. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to think about it. Like, Was that pip, your name in high school? Pip Squeak no. were like insults at the time. So <laughs> yeah, it's like don't be a Pip Squeak. Yeah. So and then we had Paul's favorite characters come out. The Smurfs. The Smurfs over in Europe and Belgium in a comic strip called Spiru. Spiru. Yeah. Spiru. <laughs> Spiru. And then um let's get into the nitty gritty with DC. Yeah, because they were still they were still kicking ass and taking names in the fifties. Yes, they they're were still kicking ass, but since it's after World War II and after the war bonds, yeah, the, the superhero genre is not as powerful anymore. Correct. They're still cranking up their their heavy hitters, but it's not the main focus of readers anymore. Yeah, because you don't have uh, heroes depict uh, hitting Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin. Right. Because they're, they're all dead. <laughs> or hiding in Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> and Argentina. Brazil and Argentina. Um, with DC, we have some big names that were introduced into DC. So we had The Flash, Barry Allen. Yep. Showcase number four. We had Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, showcase number 22. Both of these came out in 1959. Uh, we also had Supergirl. That's right. So the female superheroes are increasing at this point because mm-hmm. before it was like Wonder Woman. Right. So we had uh, we had Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, got a comic book at this time too. Yes, she did. Everybody was getting a comic book. Yeah. Which is if you go back, there was a very interesting stat. When it comes to books in general? Yes. It is a crazy stat. During the 1950s, okay, it's estimated that 80 million comics were sold every month. Damn. You don't, you don't get anywhere near that in the last 20, 30 years. 
No. Not even yeah. in the 90s. <laughs> With all and the Marion covers. And that's still a pretty penny, even at 10 cents a pop. But where are those books? <laughs> those books are probably all Paul gone. wants to know where those books are. Through 80 million comic books a month. That's a lot of comic books. Now, you have to remember, it's not just the books we know. There were a lot of romance novels. There were a lot of crime. Crime. There were a lot of westerns. uh, High school. Like, little books that we probably, that got lost in time. Yeah. But even still. But even still. Yeah, books for adults. They're out there to be found, man. I'm a firm believer that there's a lot more of these books laying around that that people want to admit. Maybe I'm sure there were a lot of books that were thrown away, like like newspapers. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure they read them and tossed them. I'm sure they were burnt. I'm sure they were tossed. I'm sure they were ruined. But out of, I mean, eighty million is a humongous number. Well, think about it. If there are eighty million comic books a month, right? A month. Imagine how many newspapers there were, and how many newspapers have actually survived the test of time. Because why would you keep a newspaper? Same reasoning. Why would you keep a comic book at the time? But I can see you keeping a comic book because of the stories. I mean, the newspaper is only relevant the day you read it, the day it comes out. Uh, unless something mm-hmm. big happens. There's people that might keep like a Yeah, the a moon landing event. or whatever. Yeah, they'll keep, yeah. hey, the U.S. enters World War II. Yeah. Hiroshima and Ar- yeah. Like those big ones, people keep because you still find those now. But comic right? books, they, they, I would say they'd have, they'd have a more of a tendency to stick around. People put them in their, in their drawer. People kept them in their closet, in a box, in their dresser, somewhere. Yeah, and, that, and that's here. Well, what about overseas? And it was more, remember, there's comic books have art. You, newspapers just have pictures. So the art was a, a big focal point on comic books and why to keep them. So, Yeah, comic yeah. strips as well were part of the newspaper. But how much were sent overseas, George? So during World War II, I know we're dipping into the 40s on this, but it's, it's relevant and you'll see why. During World War II, up to 25% of comics that were printed were shipped out to like military exchanges. So they would go overseas. Any right. bases, anywhere where people were stationed. So you can only imagine how many books are sitting there in Europe in someone's house. You know, because a lot of times maybe soldiers visited someone or were stationed somewhere and they stayed with, with people that were let in. And these books could still be there. And a lot of soldiers, I'm sure, when they were, you know, overtaking the towns, they would go in and give it to the kids yeah. in the town and the kids kept it as, you know, the gift that an American soldier that freed us from this fascist people gave, you know, gave it to him and they just kept it. There, there has to be. A huge collection of horror. I haven't had a meal, and this freaking American soldier gives me yeah, a book. What that too, but I'm this? saying, I mean, th- th- there's there's collections to be found. Listen, I'm sure there's someone out there with books like a Captain America or a Superman that a a, a, a nice battalion came in and, and right. like saved them or freed the town, and those people kept it as like a memento, exactly, you know, like a or a Coca Cola bottle, something that that a soldier gave them. I I agree with you. The books are out there. I think it's less than what you're thinking, but I think it's more than people say. So we just gave a whole game. Right. <laughs> oh, we just gave out, yeah. But I mean, it even it could be one, it could be a thousand. Even, yeah. even here, I mean, look at look at look, just I mean, eighty um, eighty million a month. That's figure a figure months. figure that that stack kept relevant for just one year. That's a lot of books. Yeah, I mentioned right uh, when we were prepping the the Walt Disney books and and, and Donald Duck books. Right, we're and, selling yeah. like a million copies a month in the and this this is in the sixties. We're not even there yet. The sixties. And, that, that much. and that's why you find a shit ton of those books yeah, later yeah, on. Yeah, but you're talking about the 50s where it's like the paper is like a lower quality paper. I'm right. sure it's more like, you know, like a thinner Even paper. The paper doesn't really change to like the 80s. Yeah. So it's a so. thinner paper. So these are books that, yeah, they'll they'll fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, it was a time of heroes. It was also a time of like iconic villains. We have mm-hmm. Mr. Freeze in Batman 121. We had uh, Brainiac in Action Comics 242. Yep. And we have probably one of the most sought after books in Batman history, Detective Comics 168, the iconic Red Hood. Oh, yeah. That book, I think I've only seen it in person at cons twice. Yeah, it's rare to find. Extremely rare to find. And when you do find it, it's very expensive. Yep. Rightfully so, because of the amount that's out there. Oh, yeah, um, I've never seen it. Yeah. You also have um, First Martian Manhunter that was introduced in Detective Comics 228. And you have. Uh, I lost my train of thought. You had a uh, first Batwoman, Kathy Kane. That's right. That she came out, and then later that presents like different iterations of it. And then you also had the time where Batman and Superman learned each other's identities. Ooh, ooh. So that was the Sexy. first time that Lois was in trouble. Batman saved her, as opposed to Superman. He couldn't get there fast enough, which is ironic. Okay. Uh, it was busy. It was busy. Yeah. And that's where they learned. It's a uh, world's finest. Uh, no, Superman seventy six, where they learn each other's identity. 
was still double digits. Still mm-hmm. double digits, <laughs> which is funny because they were in a lot of issues together and they didn't know about Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne. World's greatest detective, huh? <laughs> My ass. <laughs> <laughs> Took him a couple of years <laughs> to figure it out. And x-ray vision, come on, soups. You're going to figure it out. So if you tuned into the 1940s show, you know that EC Comics started in the 1940s. Finally, we're getting into the good stuff. The good stuff. And this is where the term pre-code horror comes into effect because there were so many horror books that came out and so many famous car- uh, horror books with the famous covers. Mm-hmm. Yes. And this is where it sort of causes the government to intervene and fuck shit up for EC Comics. Well, I guess you can, you can call it an early form of uh, cancel culture. Well, more censored. I like that, yeah. Basically, they canceled it. Somebody thought, oh, this is this is Seduction of the Innocent, which is the book that led to all this, that stopped all these uh, graphic cautionary tales for children. Mm-hmm. It is, we'll, we'll get into it now shortly, but EC got canceled. Yeah. EC got canceled out of existence. Almost. They kept, they kept Almost. Mad Magazine. That was the only thing that kept them alive, and they, they even had to adapt to that. Mm-hmm. Right, but I mean... In the grand scheme of things, EC was done. Yeah. They took them down for, yeah. So, guys, EC Comics, synonymous with horror comics. If you might not know the names or the titles, but you know these covers. Yeah. yeah. Most famous of them being Crime Suspense Stories number 22. Yes. Which is? The decapitation cover, which shows a person holding a decapitated head and a bloody axe on the other hand. Right and you see her one. legs in the background. And you see her legs in the background. And we actually had an issue of that book a couple of months ago. We did, but we don't talk about sad things, Paul. <laughs> in an EC collection that we picked up, which, again, look what we found yeah. sitting in a house somewhere in F- South Florida in yeah. 2022. Yeah, I know. It's true. We also had Crime Suspense Stories number 20, which was the infamous Hanging Man cover. Mm-hmm. Yes. The depictions in, in, in those covers was was amazing. And what what I liked about it was that it incorporated the essence of the 50s because not only the horror aspect of it, you had the sci-fi aspect of it. You had the dinosaurs. You had all these cool covers, you know, rocket covers, robot covers. That That's, to me, the 50s were the, like the birth of technology. You were getting, my, you were getting refrigerators, you were getting stoves, you were getting all these kitchen appliances, you were getting all this, these cars, these radios, these technology pieces coming out to the market. I think EC and the comic book community captured that and was able to show kids that, yeah, this is something that one day might be true just by what you're seeing happen nowadays. Mm-hmm. No, they, that's where you had all those, those sci-fi books were, were emerging at that time too. Yeah. So it's funny that you mentioned sci-fi because... You had all this advanced technology, yet they would always go back to prehistoric lands. But with? The new tech. The new, new tech. tech. But they would always go visit the same dinosaur. The red dinosaur, yeah. The red T-Rex <laughs> that looked kind of wonky, but. It's the only one they knew how to draw. <laughs> it's like that red T-Rex made a shit ton of appearances yeah. on comic book covers. Can you imagine being the T-Rex? Like, why the fuck are all these guys coming back to my time? Like, Leave me alone. But, you know, they always use a time travel machine, a rocket ship, and they always ended up, you know, in some. They, they merged the new technology. With the old stories. Which is ironic because the space race didn't really start till the late 50s and all these books came out in the early 50s. Right. So it's always that art imitating life type of scenario. But you always had, remember, you had the, uh, you had all the, the the imagery and all the stuff that they found and discovered during World War II. So you had a lot of rocket technology being emerging. Mm-hmm. You had jet engines coming into the picture. You had planes that were actually starting to become useful for the for the masses. So people started seeing that and they started depicting that. Yeah. And remember, you have scientists, they end up creating and designing things based on like a fictional story or something that they read. Right. Look at twenty thousand leagues under the sea. There was no such things as submarines when that book came out. Eventually we get submarines. They were probably People that, that read that read that book were like, hey, we can make something like that. Same thing with, with space travel, automobiles, flying cars. We're getting now we're getting these flying cars, electric cars. The flying cars are a little late though, but Yeah. <laughs> well, but now what you're getting now is like, you know, a, it looks like a car that's like a giant uh drone. Right. You know, like but it's it's those it's those stories that inspire people to then create right. the actual vehicle or the actual um technology 
that they were inspired by as a kid. And we have jetpacks now, also. We have jetpacks now. We have water jetpacks. We have those. We have air jetpacks, too. Yeah, yeah. The jet Navy packs. uses, a, like, a more the... No, and, and it, it was, I mean, it was, it, it, it captured a moment in time where, like I said, this technology was coming into fruition. People were actually starting to see, you know, just the stuff that you saw at your house, the stuff that you saw, you found at the store. It was stuff that was just being captured by these books, and it was great. Yeah. Suddenly, what was make-believe was becoming real. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I agree with you guys completely. Like, the beheading by the guillotine, you know, that was totally... Yeah. yeah. Totally. Well, but see, that, that's a different little <laughs> subgenre yeah. in what was going on. It's the, different, but yeah, at the same time, you know, werewolves started appearing, and right. vampires, and... But, yeah, yeah the, exactly, the, and it was all this whole, and you'll see why we're touching upon this, like, all of this is what led to EC's downfall. Right. And it wasn't so much the sci-fi stuff. The sci-fi stuff had, you know, some some interesting stories. You know, you had the story of the uh, the Wally Wood book that uh, that they talk about uh, sex changes. Yeah, so you have uh, It's Weird Science number 14, which is the mention of uh, gender transition. Gender transition. So, But the horror books, I mean, that put these images, you know, right smack in your face at a newsstand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just going back, Tales of, from the Crypt 44 was the beheading by a guillotine. Uh, you also had Tales from the Crypt 28, which is literally buried alive. Yeah. You see the man in the coffin trying to scratch. Yep. And then, um, yeah, all the ground on top of him, like he ain't getting out. No, and then That has to be terrifying. You, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be bad. <laughs> but you have the, 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 these images that were just so intense, man. And... The graphic image of the cover led to a great story because it was a cautionary tale for kids. To and some not, extent. And, yeah, and yeah, not just for kids. Because remember, back then, there were also lots of adults collecting. You Agreed, had, but had, there were a bunch of... that come back from the war, and that, that was their, their disconnect was reading these books. Agreed, but there was also like, you know, the creepy old man running after little kids. Yeah. Like, hey. But you wouldn't know that until you read it. And the only way you're going to read Agreed. it was by picking up the book. And what is what draws you to the book was the cover. Yeah. And you would, if you see a decapitated head on the cover, the last thing you're thinking of is there's a cautionary tale inside. You think it's a whole murder mystery yeah, that's going on yeah. in there. Speaking of cautionary tale, they also had shock suspense number 12, which is the infamous drug abuse issue. Yes. Which is the man strapped down with the syringe and the needle. Yeah, you see the drug paraphernalia on the side table. Yeah, exactly. And so, then you had the one for the the, the for for the people with the foot fetish, the hanging feet. <laughs> <laughs> How many podcasts did it take before Paul said he had a foot fetish? <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, man. What are we at? Sixty plus? <laughs> but then you had you had the one of the guy drowning the woman on the boat mm-hmm. multiple multiple of, of that and different cuts like right. some you just see the woman's head underwater some you see the man on the boat pushing the woman and it's always that type of scenery and depiction and the expression on their faces yeah like you could tell that guy wants to body that chick and you could tell she's struggling by the the actual face art that they put on her well yeah when we got the golden age collection it took us forever to do because we caught ourselves just looking at the art right and just the emotion that was portrayed in it. It's different than nowadays. Nowadays, all these, there are some good cover arts, but it's a lot of, um, a lot going on. Yeah. When it's just one person just, and you see the sheer terror. Yeah. The, the thing nowadays is, just, just real quick, it's the, the next cover art is just trying to one up the previous one. And it's just to see who can make the most controversial cover art or the most grotesque cover art or the most, you know, shocking cover art. Back then, that was the most shocking, and nobody was trying to outdo them. So they were just yeah. that was just a line of comic books that they were doing, and they were all shocking. Yeah. And that wasn't the name box, you know. No. Shock suspense. Could you imagine if they would have had some acetates as well? Oh. <laughs> 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 Woo. We're not uh, there yet. We're not there yet. We're not we're there still yet. The 1950s. So I mean <laughs> but, yeah, I wonder when the first acetate came out. <laughs> um you also had the first appearance of the Crypt Keeper, which later, you know, obviously HBO iconicized mm-hmm. with the show Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. That he came out in actually Crime Patrol fifteen. Yeah. Which just goes to show it was telling of this time that characters would come out in some weird books. And then later developed their own series. Oh, he also looked different back then. He yeah. just looked like a creepy old guy. Yeah, he looked like a creepy like old guy. He wasn't a skeleton. Yeah. So I'm actually looking for that book. What, Crime Patrol 15? Yeah. 
Guys, let us know in the comments if you <laughs> have that Paul's willing to buy. I'm buying. And if you have any Super Pros. Or US one. Or, or US one. I'm yeah, actively actually, looking for US one books. I'd yeah. actually want to find that one too now. <laughs> Anyways, back to the fifties. Come on. So back to the fifties. So with all this horror books, it led to something that is called Seduction of the Innocent. Dr. Frederick Warham, um, he is a psychiatrist. He published a book called Seduction of the Innocent in nineteen fifty four. Um, this sort of led to well, this eventually leads to those Senate hearings, and those Senate hearings lead us to the comic book uh, code authority. But before that... Wait, are you sure his name wasn't Karen? It wasn't Karen. But that's what he was back then. <laughs> Karen or Ken. So <laughs> he had an issue. He started off with the right idea. I, I just, you know, he wanted to make sure the kids weren't getting messed up with this. But he started his whole anti-comic book campaign like in the 40, in the late 40s, 47, uh, writing some articles. But then he writes this book, with like semi pseudo research, it's anecdotal. There's, it's not really data driven, and we all know it's just the same, you know, now as it was back then. You don't have to prove a fact to get the idea out there. If you could spark outrage with a sentence, that's it. Everyone's got it. You don't even have to prove it. Yeah. Well, so this was also the time of a lot of political and social tensions yes. in the world. Because in the middle of the fifties, you had the issue with with the uh, with the. Uh, with the Brown versus the yep. Board of Education, yes. segregation in schools. You had book burnings. Yes. You had everything. You had you had half of Hollywood being called communist. You had the Red Scare. So it was like it was like a perfect storm. This this happened at like this happened for him at the right moment. Because he also had political aspirations and it just kind of meshed. But this is the guy who he didn't just go after the horror books. He went after the horror and crime. But he also went over to a lesser extent of superhero books. I mean, he's the one calling that Batman's gay, and then he's in a homosexual relationship with Robin, and he's saying that. So, just to reference <laughs> that, guys. So, Seduction of the Innocent became a book published in 1954, but it goes back to the 40s and 30s, which we touched upon some of these books. World's Finest number 44. You want to know how it was referenced as a homosexual uh, relationship? How? Bruce was laying down on the couch. And Dick just sat next to him. Gay. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to think about that. It, it, at that point, like, it, that's Bruce's adopted son. That's like if it's a, <laughs> if it's a kid sitting next to his dad. Yes. Um, it's funny that you mentioned adoption because they also reference Wonder Woman having lesbian overtones with a child that she adopts. So I this mean, is this is the whole, but this is how it all starts. Remember, you only need one guy to look at something sideways, and suddenly all his inner fears come out. You know, so you have he's you know classifying Wonder Woman as lesbian because back then a strong woman had to be a lesbian; she couldn't of be course. straight. You know, yeah. and then Superman was was a symbol of violent race superiority. Wow! So, <laughs> so uh, basically, he was Homelander. Yeah, that that's what his, his yeah. view. His view was was that, which is like. You're 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 trying to you're getting a bit thin there, but that that was his whole thing. But his main focus was the horror books, understandable because the, those covers were insane and they're available at newsstands. They weren't just for kids, but kids could buy them. You know? But at the same time, if a parent that doesn't follow the books, that doesn't read the books, all of a sudden they read the Seduction of the Innocents, or they hear this guy talk, or they read an article about it, that drives them to see what's going on. And not knowing, not knowing the context of the book, they go into and look at the world's finest book, and they already have that in their head. So that just sparks, that just that just lights the fire in them. That you're assuming, says, you you're assuming what? too much. I guarantee you, they didn't do the extra mile. They saw an article about the book and said, "Oh my God, that's evil." But they're gonna go to their son's room and gonna be like, Burn "Are you reading all these books? Let me see your comic books." Oh. It, it has Batman on the cover. It might not even be the issue, but it has Batman on the cover. Burn it. Has Superman on the cover? Burn it. Yes, you're talking about people. We're referring to it happens small now. minded. It happens yes, now, yes, small minded yeah. people, and they're small minded today. It happened. Agree to us completely. When we were kids it happened in days. the '90s when Mortal Kombat came out, and they depicted blood. Right. Remember that whole depiction? Like I remember, my mom. We all would gather on the bleachers. Did you get Mortal Kombat two? Oh, did you do the fatality? Did you see all the blood? It was just a thing. It never occurred to me to throw a knife at somebody's head attached to a string. No, that's true. But you know, remember one thing too. Nowadays, there's so much information out there, and there's so much, there's so many ways to research this information. Back then, 
All you had was what? Your radio shows and your newspaper. And your news. Your, and even your news. whatever your, you know, your neighborhood community would say. So oh. the, the information that was out there was very limited. So it was easy for people to pick up on things like that and just go and run with it. But as we see now, it doesn't matter how much little or or, inf- or how much more information or little you have, the same thing happens. True. We're in the information age where you can find out anything, but you can still also find false information. But you the problem is the false information supersedes the real information because it gets spread, spread clicks. so fast. Yes. This gets clicked more, so this must be true. It's exactly. Like that, exactly. This is where common sense comes in, and it's not really common. It's not. Right. And, but you, so you see the, you almost see like an opposite reaction to the same thing. Right. What 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 they didn't have access to back then is now causing the same kind of fear. Correct. There's too much information and no one knows how to how to separate it, so it's the same hysteria. Listen, and they didn't just go after superheroes and horror. They went after Bugs Bunny, Howdy Doody, uh crime books. They went after everything because of the negative racial depictions. Correct. Which I agree, and it's a funny little known fact. Did you know that the Federal Trade Commission had to if you had a cartoon gang depicted on TV, they all could not be the same race. Really, that was an actual rule that Batman the animated series had to abide by. Really, like they all couldn't be all white, all black, all Chinese. Like the, you had to have somebody of a different race in there as well. Interesting, because yeah, kids are susceptible. Kids will understand these things, so you have to sort of throw that in there. Mm-hmm. Like with Bugs Bunny, you know, they said the whole Tweety, uh, Bugs Bunny dressing in drag. Yes. You know, Tweety Bird. You didn't know if he was a boy or a girl. Right. Um, Tom and Jerry. Yeah. You know, Howdy Doody. Uh, who else do I have here? They also had uh, romance books that they went after because men were spanking women. But did the women like it? Well, that's the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> right? the whole, that, that Sexual was, perversion yeah. at a young age. Right. You know, and now you freaking have the internet at your fingertips. Kids know more about shit everything. than we do. Yeah, but so. it, it targets everything. Yeah, it targeted books also based on um, religious views, uh, different different types of people. Yeah, lifestyles. It, it went. It went through a whole. It went through a whole gamut. You know, and it went enough that they, there was a Senate hearing because of this. Yeah. And let's go back to EC. EC publishes that. Crime suspense stories issue twenty two, and that's like the nail in the coffin. That's exhibit A. That's the cover they keep throwing over and over and over again as as the reason why there needs to be something done about this. My favorite was that Vault of Horror thirty five wasn't that one. That is the famous Christmas cover where this woman gets a casket as a Christmas present, and then you see her husband with an axe right behind her, about ready to slice her. Because he could just be going to open up the casket for her. True. You know? He could. You're the casket's right. closed. It was closed. It's got to break it open. It's got gifts inside. It's got gifts inside. Look, let's, let's be honest. <laughs> Crime 22. Is a shocking cover. Agreed. Is really out there in imagery. You know, the funny thing is, though, uh, Marvel did an homage to it with Sabretooth's head. Yeah. Yes. It so it's insane. like. Yeah. But it's not as. Th- there's no red blood. Well, there's a variant that has it. Yeah. And his head is, you could tell, is completely detached from a body. Right. So. But the, the imagery on Crime 22 is pretty severe, man. Even the axe has the blood on they it. They even did a stray dogs very homage yeah. to it. Yeah, but it's different. That, that's but not this a different times though. towards kids. And it's different now. You don't have that comic authority anymore. You go to a shop. They're rated for certain ages, blah, 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 blah. People nowadays know a little more about a lot of things. So it's viewed a little differently now. I mean, times change, man. Times change. We didn't. It's the whole was were things happening and just people didn't know about it because of the lack of information or just were things not happening back then? I think the lack of information was a big thing. I think it's a little bit of both. I think, it was I think more lack, lack of, of information, information. Yes, things were happening, but not to the degree that it was made to be. But again, you see, well, yeah, you see it in the 50s. You see it. You know, in the 80s, you see it in the 90s, you see it in every decade. It's just to what extent it gets taken to. I mean, Mortal Kombat was a perfect example. Yeah. Mortal Kombat is almost exactly to the T what these covers were doing. Which is what brought about the game ratings. Right. That was when TVMA, you know, this game is rated M for Mature, 17 plus, Call of Duty. Like, we've all seen it. Because to be able to go to a newsstand and pick up a comic book that has a decapitated head is the same thing as going to an arcade and putting a quarter in the machine and ripping out somebody's heart. 
Yeah, there's nothing to stop you from doing it. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. The, you know, the, the, the medium is different, but the essence of it is the same. I think during this time, too, you know, with everything going on, there's also the whole, like, the youth rebelling against the authority, and that's one of the things that, that led this psychiatrist to do what he did also. Completely agree. The youth rebelling, uh, the race wars were pretty much big, segregation, you know, it was a different time. But I still feel that was the comic code authority necessary? I think that's the true question. It, um, there was a, again a good intent behind it. I understand the reason. For I don't it. think there was a good intent behind it. I think it was self serving to the psychiatrist Frederick Warham, uh, self serving to be able to be like, look, I changed the youth, and he did have political aspirations. He did, which is why he lets go of this fight against the comics. He, they, they don't keep going because he's got political aspirations. But I will say this. Before he got into the whole anti-comics thing, he had um, he had worked on a case on this, like, uh, convicted, like, it was a child serial killer. Like, he testified for um, for the... Um, the prosecution? For the state, yeah. For, for the prosecution for this guy. A serial killer that killed children. That's where he started to see, like, what is affecting people. And I think that led him to make connections that weren't there yet, which is what happens when people start grasping what it's causing, what causes someone to do some like horrific action. And you try to find meaning and what is it? Um, Columbine. Let's go to late nineties real quick. They couldn't figure out why, why these kids decided they were going to kill their classmates. And they point at grand theft auto, the video games. Yeah. They point at things that this has to be the only explanation. So that's where you start going. What explains it? Bro, some people are just messed up, man. And it's not that one thing that does it, but they're trying to they're trying to justify. You're trying to grasp at straws, right? So let's. Oh, you you need a scapegoat. Yeah, you need need, something to point your finger at. We need something like that you can hold on to, right? And that's what happened with comics in the '50s. And we see that every few decades, something new gets tagged as uh, this is what's causing the 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 downward spiral of the youth. So I'm calling it now, and we'll have the receipts to prove it. I say the next thing that gets uh, this level of scrutiny which is still too in its infancy, is the metaverse. I thought you were going to say TikTok. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I say the metaverse. We'll see. It could. Yeah. We'll see. It could. Because, like, it look could, at the yeah. mediums. First, it started with uh, comic books. Then it went into movies and TVs. Then mm-hmm. it went into video games. What's the next evolution? Because it's a medium that's geared towards kids. Social media in and of itself, yes. You know, you have restrictions now. Right. Yeah. But... Yeah, I say it's probably metaverse. So buckle up, Zuckerberg. Yeah, <laughs> buckle up, Zuckerberg. <laughs> but what, what's interesting about all of this is that aside from being the EC killer, because obviously, obviously EC didn't survive past the seduction of the innocence comic That'd code be a authority. Cool villain's name, EC killer. There you go. Killer. <laughs> but it lays the groundwork for later on. Oh well, yeah, with Marvel and DC coming into the sixties, and it lays the groundwork for. How do I get around the system? Exactly. Which goes back yeah. to what was left of EC, which was Mad Magazine. Right. So Mad Magazine 1 was published in a comic book format. Yep. So Mad Magazine 24 is the first Mad Magazine that's actually published in magazine style format, which is the way they were able to circumvent the code, the comic right. code mm-hmm. authority. And they still, you know, Alfred E. Newman, the parody, the disgusting. They were more on the humor parody disgusting side. Right. Versus the murder horror side. Right. But then Marvel comes up with also inventive ways to get around some of these things. Well, they publish books that are not approved by the comic code authority. Oh, not even that. Because Mephisto, you couldn't use Satan or the devil as a character. So Marvel comes up with Mephisto. Let's save this this for the next part. Well, I'm just saying how they go around this comic book code is they create characters that are homages or... Other characters that are not being able to use because the comic code exists. Yeah, that's very true. There's a lot of things that the comic book code authority did though that was detrimental to comics in general. Yeah. Besides taking away, you know, the 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 crime books and the horror books, some crime books stayed, but they were like shadows of their former selves yeah. because you had to the cops had to be like upstanding citizens. You always looked up to the police officers. Right. You couldn't degrade. Yeah, them. exactly how it is yeah. today. You couldn't. You couldn't. You couldn't. Um, you couldn't have villains that were like. That, that you could root for. Like, the bad guy had to be bad guy, and that's right. it. There was nothing interesting about them. You couldn't, like, empathize with them. They just had to be the bad guy. But it also killed the the um, the variety of comics. 
you know, you no longer had, because of all the other rules, you no longer had these books that had like, women as like the main hero. Correct. You no longer had books with like um, other races and religions because that was a hot topic. So you couldn't talk about that because you couldn't, you couldn't show any religion in like a negative light. So yeah, it's like after 9-11. Yeah. So real. now all these books that were out before that were big. I mean, you saw the 30s. There were a bunch of books that had like female uh, heroes. Yeah. They're now gone. You know, so it was it, it destroyed a vast majority of of content that, that was out there because they weren't able to publish it anymore. Yeah. In a nice little life imitating art. And it relates to EC Comics. I found this kind of interesting. Oh, I thought it was how Paul eats a banana, but go ahead. <laughs> you threw a picture of that up? Yeah. So, it, it, you know, after the whole, you know, this whole thing with like EC going, mostly going out of business, you know, the last yeah. horror comics being published in 1955. Um, there's a funny thing here. Bob Wood, who's one of the co-creators of um, Crime Doesn't Pay. Crime okay. Does Not Pay, which launched the whole like crime genre. Yeah. Okay, so 1955, the, the last issue is, is published, okay? In 1958, Bob Wood is arrested and charged for beating a woman to death in a drunken argument. Nice. All right? Then <laughs> he serves his time three years later. After he's released, a couple years after that, he gets hit and, he gets hit and killed by, by a car. Wow. I mean, if... if Karma, uh, it's fine. Was it a woman driver? I have no idea. It doesn't say. <laughs> that would have been but karma man, at its Talk finest. about a guy who built his career on like these true crime books. That's great. Kills a woman and then gets hit by a car and killed later on. Damn. It is yeah. life imitating art. <laughs> yeah. It, it's crazy. It's crazy, man. Let's know, I mean, guys, the 50s, there's so much more that we could have touched upon. But let's be real. If you had to define the 50s in comics, it would be seduction of the innocent. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing it, else. It changed to talk, the whole like, landscape of comics changed after that. For a time, and yeah. then we get around it. But let us know in the comments. Let us know what you think. Uh, did any cover that we would not mention, like, just pop to mind when you think of horror? You know, yeah, list them out because there's a lot. There's a lot of comics that came out in that time, and there's some iconic covers that came out, and they might not be in the Seduction of the Innocents listed per se, but there are some good ones out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just look: uh, shock suspense stories, crime suspense stories, tales from the crypt, vault of horror. Weird fantasy, weird science. There's so much you could go and go down the rabbit hole. Guys, thanks for watching the video. If you like it, appease the algorithm gods. Hit the like bell, hit the like button, leave a comment, subscribe, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and any other social media platform. Thanks for watching.